my foundation for life and everything is because of a little community called Center Point. I feel so blessed that I was born there. So you want me to tell you about the school and the all? Okay. The community it was an all black community. I don't know how it happened that they settled there, but the people owned their own land and were prosperous. We never had that a feeling of oppression that was going on in those days because the community was self sustaining. There was a, we had our own store and for instance for movies. At that time blacks would have to go up in a little dirty balcony in the uh, movie theater if they wanted to go. Well, our school provided movies. We didn't have to go up there and be involved in that. In the early years, when African Americans hardly finished grade school or went to school, this community had a grade school, high school, college extension courses, Everything in the community revolved around the school. In that community, education was like eating or breathing. You didn't ask, are you going to college, or is, which one are you going to? I do not know how much education my grandmother had, but she was, every night, uh, she would sit in the rocking chair and I'd sit on the floor and I would have some kind of a lesson and I looked forward to it. So she taught me a song and had me to, I guess I was just a toddler and uh, had me to perform at church one Sunday. And of course everybody was amazed at this, that I could, that I had remembered the words in the first place. So I I guess that was the start of, that was my first performance. And I've been going, I've enjoyed it from then on. And the things that I've done have just happened. I haven't gone out pursuing a career in singing, but just beautiful things have happened through my life. I guess God just deemed it so. My family has been very, very supportive of anything I've done. And I can remember doing concerts, see, when I was in college and looking out at the audience and seeing the pride on their faces as I was performing. My mother, we could not afford uh, to pay for lessons. My mother who worked, had a regular job, she was a practical nurse, but on the weekend, uh, she would go and iron or clean for my teacher so that I could have lessons. Now, I just, and as we got older, any time that my mom kind of got on my nerves a little bit or what, I'd think about that. I said, Peggy, you just get her off your nerves. Because a mother who would go to that extent to encourage you, you just can't have, you can't get mad at her. She was a beautiful, beautiful person. I was very fortunate. I was able to work with some um, wonderful people. And I guess the highlight would be working with Duke Ellington. That was a tremendous experience and I'll always remember it and uh, remember him too. I uh, auditioned for Mr. Ellington one year and for the next couple of years he would call at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. Not once did he say pardon me for calling you at this time. <laughs> it was just, that's the way, the time you're supposed to call people. And uh, he would leave, uh, tell me where he was going to be per 
performing in the Bay Area and leave two tickets for me to be able to come and see him. And one morning about three o'clock he called and asked if I was singing any place. And it just happened I was doing a concert and he came to that concert. Oh, the audience was, they couldn't believe it. You could hear <gasps> gasping as he walked in. But anyhow, he, as a result of that, he hired me to do his sacred concert at the cathedral in San Francisco. And it was a great experience. But jazz musicians are different. They don't have to do a lot of rehearsing like we do, and that was kind of new for me. <laughs> there was a time that I thought I would try to do a pop song. I thought the audience would, uh, would appreciate that. And afterwards, as people were coming up and saying how nice things as they always do, whether you've done well or not. <laughs> And this one lady came up to me and patted me on the back and said, Honey, uh, keep on singing the way you've been singing. <laughs> that was a, a hit. <laughs> Don't try pop. <laughs> so I haven't since then. <laughs> but you know, I look back and uh, so much of... I was went to a church in Portland I joined when I was eight years old. A lady who uh, lived with us, rented a room from my mom, um, invited me to go to church with her. Now mind you, I've always had a healthy appetite. And we went to the church, and that day they were having, I don't know what they were celebrating, but they had food from one end of the yard to the other end. And I made up my mind right then and there, I was gonna join that church. And I did, and later on, my mom joined and our family joined. But I look back and that was such a good foundation. We had a youth group, a uh, youth choir, and uh, the lady that was in charge of the choir could not play gospel music, thank goodness. So uh, we uh, did music from music. We did anthems, we did spirituals, and at that time, each organization in the church was required to raise so, so much money and, you know, to keep the church going. Shoot, we would always have our money because we would have uh, events and they allowed us to do all of the planning. That is, the grown-ups weren't telling us what to do. We were organized and I look back on that and I think that was good training for some of the things I'm doing now as a grown-up. And um, I'm just very thankful for that experience. You didn't ask me about that, but that's... <laughs> now as for my husband, Clarence Shivers, a beautiful, beautiful human being. He was uh, one of the Tuskegee Airmen, as, as everyone knows, and had the privilege and joy of being commissioned to do the sta uh, statue. That was the first memorial, I think, too, uh, to the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, and this statue stands near the chapel out at the academy, and we are, we're just so proud. I think he did a wonderful job. For those of you who don't know, I'm a former Tuskegee Airman. I went through pilot training during World War II. And when I came here and saw the academy, I said, well, they should have something reminiscent of the training that I went through during World War II, the Tuskegee Airmen. So I took it upon myself to work toward getting a statue up there. And that statue up there, if you look at it real closely, you'll see a slight <laughs> No, I'm just kidding now. <laughs> I mean, the guy's good looking, so that eliminates me right there. One thing that people did not, might not know is that Clarence was a painter. He wasn't a sculptor. When I finished flying training at Tuskegee, I never thought I'd do that. I hadn't even finished high school. 
But when I finished that program, I realized at that point, I can do any damn thing I want to do if I set my mind to it. And believe me, I've lived that, and I've done a lot of things that I never thought I would do. I think if you see it, you'll be quite pleased. He did a wonderful, wonderful job. So uh, I'm just thrilled. And also, I'm, I, you know, I have to put this in there, but I don't know the exact reason why, but the Academy gave us special permission that he is buried at the Academy, which means I will be too. And you know, that's limited only to people who have graduated from there or are closely connected somehow. But they made an exception, and my husband is buried at the Academy. Peggy and her husband, the late Clarence Shivers, absolutely experienced discrimination, racism, and pain, all of that. It's clear what they were able to achieve in the fields of classical music and Clarence in the field of visual arts at a time when African Americans were not thought to have that ability is simply amazing. But what's more amazing and what's more encouraging is that they used their pain, which was real, to help inform and shape their art. And their art was and is simply beautiful. My husband had done a uh, wonderful, he had a wonderful commission from Miller Brewing Company where he was to do a calendar, and uh, the subject matter was civil rights leaders, and he was responsible for the writing as well as the artwork. And uh, he went to the library to do some research and came back. He was kind of, he was very disappointed. He just didn't find that much about African Americans in the library at that time. So, we just decided to do something about that. Clarence came into the library to try to do some research on African Americans in the, the Western United States. And when he came here, he found that we didn't have a whole lot, that um, it was a difficult topic to research. And he set it upon himself, he and his wife, to fix it. And so they did a very generous gift to the library in, in 1993 to establish this fund. And at our 25th anniversary, which fell over Thanksgiving, uh, we had five days of events, and of course one of the things was an art show. And uh, we sold lots of work, um, uh, lots of work. So we took a portion of the money from the art sale, approached the library and told them we would like to start an African-American historical and cultural collection. And they welcomed us with open arms. And this is how the Shivers Fund at Pikes Peak Library District began. The Shivers Fund is designed to make sure that we have one of the best collections in the Western United States on the African-American experience. One specification we had that we did not want a, a black history room or a black history corner. We wanted all of the books to be integrated. That is, if it's a novel, it goes in the novel section. If it's a children's book, it goes in the children's book section. And that's the way it's been handled. The Shivers Fund really enriches everyone's lives who are trying to understand what it means to be black in the Western United States the arts, the culture, the experience. It really is one of the most incredible funds I've ever worked with in terms of the reach and the scope it has and just the gift it is to this community. My goodness, everybody needs to know about their themselves and the, and the, the history of their background. And then people who are not African-American, uh, uh, important for them to know about what African Americans have contributed or what the history is behind it. 
I I just it's just a just something that should be done as far as I'm concerned. The other thing it does is it's an arts and culture fund. And so it funds things uh, such as the Shivers Concert Series. It funds scholarships for um, young artists in the Pikes Peak region. It funds events. It's done an incredible amount in Colorado Springs and all of El Paso County to really enrich people's lives with an understanding of what it means to be black in the United States, but then also what it might mean to be a black artist in, in the United States as well. It is, without a doubt, one of the most just expansive funds that I've ever worked with as a library director in terms of the reach and the scope that it has. I cannot say enough about the cooperation that, I, that we've received from the library, and I, I really, really appreciate it. I thank them very much. Peggy has a beautiful spirit. And when I say she has a beautiful spirit, it's, it's, it's her belief in the beauty of people, the beauty of this community, the beauty of music, and also in the beauty and power of change to make our community and society better. Peggy has always been an inspiration. She really just is a foundational element of this community and what she has done to bring this community together. A lot of people recognize Fannie Mae Duncan and her contributions. I'd put Peggy Shivers right up there with her in terms of, if anything, she's kind of carried that legacy forward and she's brought it into the, into the 21st century. When you think about the community, it's hard not to think about Peggy Shivers. Peggy Shivers is just a fixture in the Colorado Springs community, and a fixture in a good way. She's part of the fabric and the structure that holds this community together. She's generous with her time, she's generous with her resource, and she's such an advocate for the power of the arts and how arts make Colorado Springs and the Pikes Peak region a better place to live. I just feel very strongly that when you live in a community, it is up to you as a citizen of that community to do all you can to make that community the best community it is possible. She's an inspiration in not to get weary and to keep on doing those things that are right, right for people, right for the environment, right for the arts, that collectively will just move our community forward. It's, it's just a part of me, that's just, that's just the way it is.